The Curse of Mother Flood by Henry Kendall, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Wizened the wood is, and wan is the way through it. White as a corpse is the face of the fen. Only blue adders abide in and stray through it, adders and venom and horrors to men. Here is the ghost of a garden whose minister fosters strange blossoms that startle and scare. Red as a man's blood is the sun that with sinister flame is a menace of hell in the air. Wrinkled and haggard the hills are. The jags of them gape like to living and ominous things. Storm and dry thunder cry out in the crags of them. Fire and the wind with a woe in its wings. Never a moon without clammy cold shroud on it hitherward comes or a flower-like star only the hiss of the tempest is loud on it hiss in the moan of a bitter sea bar here on this waste and to left and to right of it never is lisp or the ripple of rain fierce is the daytime and wild is the night of it flame without limit and frost without wane trees half alive with the sense of a curse on them shudder and shrink from the black heavy gale ghastly with boughs like the plumes of a hearse on them barren of blossom and blasted with bale under the cliff that stares down to the south of it backed by the horns of a hazardous hill dumb is the gorge with a grave in the mouth of it still as a corpse in a coffin is still never there hovers a hope of the spring by it never a glimmer of yellow and green only the bat with a whisper of wing by it flits like a life out of flesh and unseen here are the growths that are livid and glutinous speckled and bloated with poisonous blood this is the haunt of the viper breed mutinous cursed with the curse of weird catherine flood he that hath looked on it hurried aghast from it hair of him frozen with horror straightway chased by a sudden strange pestilent blast from it where is the speech of him what can he say hath he not seen the fierce ghost of a hag in it heard maledictions that startle the stars dumb is his mouth as a mouth with a gag in it mute is his life as a life within bars just the one glimpse of that grey shrieking woman there ringed by a circle of furnace and fiend he that went happy and healthy and human there where shall the white leper fly to be cleaned here in a pit with indefinite doom on it here in the fumes of a feculent moat under an alp with inscrutable gloom on it squats the wild witch with a ghoul at her throat black execration that cannot be spoken of speech of red hell that would suffocate song starts from this terror with never a token of day and its loveliness all the year long sin without name to it man never heard of it crime that would startle a fiend from his lair blasted this glen and the leaf and the bird of it where is the hope for it father oh where far in the days of our fathers the life in it blossomed and beamed in the sight of the sun yellow and green and the purple were rife in it singers of morning and waters that run storm of the equinox shed no distress on it thunder spoke softly and summer-time left sunset's forsaken bright beautiful dress on it blessing that shone half the night in the cleft hymns of the highlands hosanna from hills by it psalms of great forests made holy the spot cool with the mosses and clear were the rills by it far in the days when the horror was not twenty miles south is the strong shining hawksbury spacious and splendid and lordly with blooms there between mountains magnificent walks bury miles of their beauty and green myrtle glooms there in the dell is the fountain with falls by it falls and a torrent of summering stream there is the cave with the highland halls by it haunt of the echo and home of the dream 
over the hill by the marvellous base of it wanders the wind with a song in its breath out to the sea with the gold on the face of it twenty miles south of the valley of death end of poem this recording is in the public domain on a spanish cathedral by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org, by Algie pug every happy expression in these stanzas may fairly be claimed by the honourable w b dally author's note deep under the spires of a hill by the feet of the thunder-cloud trod i pause in a luminous still magnificent temple of god at the steps of the altar august a vision of angels in stone i kneel with my head to the dust on the floors by the seraphim known no father in jesus is near with the high the compassionate face but the glory of godhead is here its presence transfigures the place behold in this beautiful fane with the lights of blue heaven impearled i think of the elders of spain in the deserts the wilds of the world i think of the wanderers poor who knelt on the flints and the sands when the mighty and merciless moor was lord of the lady of lands where the african scimitar flamed with a swift bitter death in its kiss the fathers unknown and unnamed found god in cathedrals like this the glow of his spirit the beam of his blessing made lords of the men whose food was the herb of the stream whose roof was the dome of the den and far in the hills by the sea these awful hierophants prayed for rome and its temples to be in a temple by deity made who knows of their faith of its power perhaps with the light in their eyes they saw in some wonderful hour the marvel of centuries rise perhaps in some moment supreme when the mountains were holy and still they dreamed the magnificent dream that came to the monks of seville surrounded by pillars and spires whose summits shone out in the glare of the high omnipotent fires who knows what was seen by them there be sure if they saw in the noon of their faith some ineffable fane they looked on the church like a moon dropped down by the lord into spain and the elders who shone in the time when christ over christendom beamed may have dreamed at their altars sublime the dream that their fathers had dreamed by the glory of italy moved the majesty shining in rome they turned to the land that they loved and prayed for a church in their home and a soul of unspeakable fire descended on them and they fought and laboured a life for the spire and tower and dome of their thought these grew under blessing and praise as morning in summer time grows as troy in the dawn of the days to the music of delphicus rose in the land of bewildering light where the feet of the season are springs they worked in the day and the night surrounded by beautiful things the wonderful blossoms in stone the flower and leaf of the moor on column and cupola shone and gleamed on the glimmering floor in a splendour of colour and form from the marvellous african's hands yet vivid and shining and warm they planted the flower of the lands inspired by the patience supreme of the mute the magnificent past they toiled till the dome of their dream in the firmament blossomed at last just think of these men of their time of the days of their deed and the scene how touching their zeal how sublime their suppression of self must have been in a city yet hacked by the sword and scarred by the flame of the moor they started the work of their lord sad silent and solemnly poor these fathers how little they thought of themselves and how much of the days when the children of men would be brought to pray in their temple and praise ah full of the radiant still heroic old life that has flown the merciful monks of seville toiled on and died bare and unknown the music the colour 
the gleam of their mighty cathedral will be hereafter a luminous dream of the heaven i never may see to a spirit that suffers and seeks for the calm of a competent creed this temple whose majesty speaks becomes a religion indeed the passionate lights the intense the ineffable beauty of sound go straight to the heart through the sense as a song would of seraphim crowned and lo by these altars august the life that is highest we live and are filled with the infinite trust and the peace that the world cannot give they have passed have the elders of time they have gone but the work of their hands preeminent peerless sublime like a type of eternity stands they are mute are the fathers who made this church in the century dim but the dome with their beauty arrayed remains a perpetual hymn their names are unknown but so long as the humble in spirit and pure are worshipped in speech and in song our love for these monks will endure and the lesson by sacrifice taught will live in the light of the years with a reverence not to be bought and a tenderness deeper than tears end of poem this recording is in the public domain rover by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by nemo no classic warrior tempts my pen to fill with verse these pages no lordly-hearted man of men my muses thought engages let others choose the mighty dead and sing their battles over my champion too has fought and bled my theme is one-eyed rover a grave old dog with tattered ears too sore to cock up reader a four-legged hero full of years but sturdy as a cedar still age is age and if my rhyme is dashed with words pathetic don't wonder friend i've seen the time when rove was more athletic he lies coiled up before me now a comfortable crescent his night-black nose and grizzled brow fixed in a fashion pleasant but ever and anon he lifts the one good eye i mention and tries a thousand doggish shifts to rivet my attention just let me name his name and up you'll see him start and patter towards me like a six-months pup in point of speed but fatter he pokes his head upon my lap nor heeds the whip above him because he knows the dear old chap his human friends all love him our younger dogs cut off from hence at sight of lash uplifted but rove with grand indifference remains and can't be shifted and ah the set upon his fizz at meals defies expression for i confess that rover is a cager by profession the lesser favorites of the place at dinner keep their distance but by my chair one grizzled face begs on with brave persistence his jaws present a toothless sight but still my hearty hero can satisfy an appetite which brings a bone to zero and while spot barks and pussy mews to move the cook's compassion he takes his after-dinner snooze in genuine biped fashion in fact in this our ancient pet so hits off human nature that i at times almost forget he's but a dog in feature between his tail and bright old eye the swift communications outstrip the messages which fly from telegraphic stations and ah that tail's rich eloquence conveys too clear a moral for men who have a grain of sense about its drift to quarrel at night his voice is only heard when it is wanted badly for rover is too cute a bird to follow shadows madly the pup and carlo in the dark will start at crickets churring but when we hear the old dog bark we know there's something stirring he knows a gun does rover hear and if i cock a trigger he makes himself from tail to ear an admirable figure for once the following piece is out and game is on the tappy the set upon my hero snout would make a cockle happy and as for horses why betwixt our chestnut mare and rover the mutual friendship is as fixed as any love of lover and when his master's hand resigns the bridle for the paddle his dogship on the grass reclines and stays and minds the saddle of other friends he has no lack 
Gray pussy is his crony, and kittens mount upon his back as youngsters mount a pony. They talk of man's superior sense and charge the few of treason, who think a dog's intelligence is very like our reason. But though philosophy has tried a score of definitions, twixt man and dog it can't decide their relative positions. And I believe upon the whole, though you my creed deny, sir, that rove's entitled to a soul as much as you or I, sir. Indeed, I fail to see the force of your derisive laughter, because I will not say my horse has not some horse hereafter. A fig for dogmas, let them pass. There's much in life to grieve us, and what most grieves is this, alas, that all our best friends leave us. And when I sip my nightly grog and watch old Rover blinking, this royal ruin of a dog calls forth some serious thinking. For though he's lightly touched by fate, I cannot help remarking, the step of age is in his gait, its hoarseness in his barking. He still goes on his rounds at night to keep off forest prowlers, but ah, he has no teeth to bite, the cunning-hearted howlers. Not like the rover that erewhile gave droves of dingoes battle, and dashed through flood in fierce defile, the friend but dread of cattle. Not like to him that, in past years, won fight by fight and scattered, whole tribes of dogs with rags of ears, and tail ends torn and tattered. But while time tells upon our pet, and makes him grayer daily, he is a noble fellow yet, and wears his old age gaily. Still dogs must die, and in the end, when he is past caressing, will mourn him like some human friend, whose presence was a blessing. Till then be bred in peace his lot, a life of common clover, the pup may sleep outside with spot, we'll keep the nook for rover. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Melbourne International Exhibition by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Written for Music 1. Brothers from faraway lands, sons of the fathers of fame, here are our hearts and our hands, this is our song of acclaim. Lords from magnificent zones, shores of superlative sway, awful with lustre of thrones, this is our greeting today. Europe and Asia are here, shining they enter our ports. She that is half of the sphere beams like a sun in our courts. Children of elders whose day shone to the planet's white ends, meet in the noble old way, sons of your forefathers' friends. 2. Dressed is a beautiful city, the spires of it burn in the firmament stately and still. Forest has vanished, the wood and the lyres of it, lutes of the sea wind and harps of the hill. This is the region, and here is the bay by it, Collins, the deathless, beheld in a dream. Flinders and Faulkner, our forefathers grey, by it paused in the hush of a season supreme. Here, on the waters of majesty near to us, lingered the leaders by towers of flame, elders who turned from the lordly old year to us, crowned with the lights of ineffable fame. 3. Nine and seventy years ago, up the blaze of yonder bay, on a great exalted day, came from seas, august with snow, waters where the whirlwinds blow, First of England's sons who stood by the deep green bygone wood, where the wild song used to flow nine and seventy years ago. Five and forty years ago, on a grand auspicious morn, when the south wind blew his horn, where the splendid mountains glow, peaks that God and sunrise know, came the fearless famous band, founders of our radiant land, from the lawns where roses grow, Five and forty years ago. Four. By gracious slopes of fair green hills, In shadows cool and deep, Where floats the psalm of many rills, The noble elders sleep. But while their children's children last, While seed from seedling springs, The print and perfume of their past Will be as deathless things. 
Their voices are with vanished years, with other days and hours. Their homes are sanctified by tears. They sleep amongst the flowers. They do not walk by street or stream, or tread by grove or shore. But in the nation's highest dream, they shine for evermore. 5. By lawny slope and lucent strand are singing flags of every land. On streams of splendour, bays impearled, the keels are here of all the world. With lutes of light and cymbals clear, we waft goodwill to every sphere. The links of love today are thrown from sea to sea, from zone to zone. And lo, we greet, in glory dressed, the lords that come from east and west, and march like noble children forth to meet our fathers from the north. 6. To thee be the glory, O bountiful giver. The song that we sing is an anthem to thee, whose blessing is shed on thy people for ever, whose love is like beautiful light on the sea. Behold, with high sense of thy mercy unsleeping, we come to thee, kneel to thee, praise thee and pray. O Lord, in whose hand is the strength that is keeping the storm from the wave and the night from the day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By the Cliffs of the Sea by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo In memory of Samuel Bennett In a far away glen of the hills Where the bird of the night is at rest Shut in from the thunder that fills The fog-hidden caves of the west in a sound of the leaf and the lute of the wind on the quiet lagoon, I stand like a worshipper, mute in the flow of a marvelous tune. In the song that is sweet to my senses, near my God unto thee, but it carries me souring hence to a grave by the cliffs of the sea. So many have gone that I loved, so few of the fathers remain that where in old seasons I moved I could never be happy again. In the breaks of this beautiful psalm, with its deep, its devotional tone, in hints of ineffable calm, I feel like a stranger, alone. No wonder my eyes are so dim. Your trouble is heavy on me, O widow and daughter of him who sleeps in the grave by the sea. The years have been hard that have pressed on a head full of premature gray. Since Stenhouse went down to his rest, and Harper was taken away. In the soft, yellowing evening ends, the wind of the water is faint. By the home of the last of my friends, the shrine of the father and saint. The tenderness touching the grace of Ridley no more is for me and flowers have hidden the face of the brother who sleeps by the sea. The vehement voice of the South is loud where the journalist lies, but calm hath encompassed his mouth, and sweet is the peace in his eyes. Called hence by the power who knows when the work of a hero is done, he turned at the message and rose with the harness of diligence on. In the midst of magnificent toil, he bowed at the holy decree, and green is the grass on the soil of the grave by the cliffs of the sea. I knew him, indeed, and I knew, having suffered so much in his day, what a beautiful nature and true in Bennett was hidden away. In the folds of his shame without end, when the lips of the scorner were curled. I found in this brother a friend, the last that was left in the world. Ah, under the surface austere compassion was native to thee. I send from my solitude here this rose for the grave by the sea. To the high, the heroic intent of a life that was never at rest, he held with a courage unspent, 
through the worst of his days and the best. Far back in the years that are dead he knew of the bitterness cold that saddens with silver the head and makes a man suddenly old. The dignity gracing his grief was ever a lesson to me. He lies under blossom and leaf in a grave by the cliffs of the sea. Above him the wandering face of the moon is a loveliness now, and anthems encompass the place from lutes of the luminous bough. The forelands are fiery with foam where often and often he roved. He sleeps in the sight of the home that he built by the waters he loved. The wave is his fellow at night, and the sun, shining over the lea, sheds out an unspeakable light on this grave by the cliffs of the sea. And a poem, this recording is in the public domain. Galatea by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk A silver slope, a fall of firs, A league of gleaming grasses, And fiery cones, and sultry spurs, And swarthy pits and passes. The long-haired cyclops baited breath, And bit his lip, and hearkened, and dug and dragged the stone of death by ways that dipped and darkened. Across a tract of furnaced flints there came a wind of water from yellow banks with tender hints of Tethys, white armed daughter. She sat amongst wild singing weeds by beds of myrrh and moly and asus made a flute of reeds and drew its accents slowly and taught its spirit subtle sounds that leapt beyond suppression and paused and panted on the bounds of fierce and fitful passion then he who shaped the cunning tune by keen desire made bolder fell fainting like a fervent noon upon the sea-nymph's shoulder sicilian sons had laid a dower of light and life about her her beauty was a gracious flower the heart fell dead without her ah gallant said polypheme i would that i could find thee some finest tone of hill or stream wherewith to lull and bind thee what lyre is left of marvellous range whose subtle strings containing some note supreme might catch and change or set thy passion waning thy passion for the fair-haired youth whose fleet light feet perplex me by ledges rude on paths uncouth and broken ways that vex me ah turn to me else violent sleep shall track the cunning lover and thou wilt wait and thou wilt weep when i his haunts discover but golden galatea laughed and thosa's son like thunder broke through a rifty runnel shaft and dashed its rocks asunder and poised the bulk and hurled the stone and crushed the hidden aces and struck with sorrow drear and lone the sweetest of all faces to zeus the mighty father she with plaint and prayer departed then from fierce etna to the sea a fountained water started a loosened stream of lutes and lights cool haunt of flower and feather whose silver days and yellow nights made years of hallowed weather here galatea used to come 
and rest beside the river because in faint soft blowing foam her shepherd lived forever end of poem this recording is in the public domain black kate by henry kendall read for LibriVox.org by nemo kate they say is seventeen do not count her sweet you know arms of her are rather lean ditto calves and feet you know features of hellenic type are not patent here you see katie loves a black clay pipe doesn't hate her beer you see spartan helen used to wear tresses in a plate perhaps kate has ochre in her hair nose is rather flat perhaps rose lorraine surpassing dress glitters at the ball you see daughter of the wilderness has no dress at all you see laura's lovers every day in sweet verse embody her katie's have a different way being frank they waddy her amy by her suitor kissed every nightfall looks for him kitty's sweetheart isn't missed kitty humps and cooks for him smith and brown in jenkins bring roses to the fair you know darkies at their katie fling hunks of native bear you know english girls examine well all the food they take you twig kate is hardly keen of smell kate will eat a snake you twig yonder lady's sitting room clean and cool and dark it is kitty's chamber needs no broom just a sheet of bark it is you may find a pipe or two if you poke and grope about not a bit of starch or blue not a sign of soap about girl i know reads lala rook poem of the heady sort kate is better as a cook of the rough and ready sort byron's verse on waterloo makes my darling glad you see kate prefers a kangaroo which is very sad you see other ladies wear a hat fit to write a sonnet on kitty has the naughty cat neither hat nor bonnet on fifty silks has madame tate she who loves to spank it on all her clothes are worn by kate when she has her blanket on let her rip the phrygian boy bolted with a brighter one and the girl who ruined troy was a rather whiter one katie's mouth is hardly greek hardly like a rose it is katie's nose is not antique not the classic nose it is dryad in the grand old day though she walked the woods about didn't smoke a penny clay didn't hump her goods about daphne by the fairy lake far away from din and all never ate a yard of snake head and tail and skin and all end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Hyde Park Larrikin by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug To the servants of God that are to be found in every denomination, these verses, of course, do not apply. Henry Kendall You may have heard of Proclus, sir, if you have been a reader, and you may know a bit of her who helped the Lycian leader. I have my doubts. The head you sport now mark me don't get crusty it's hardly of the classic sort your law i think is fusty most likely you have stuck to tracts flushed through with flaming curses i judge you neighbour by your acts so don't you damn my verses but to my theme the asian sage whose name above i mention lived in a pitchy pagan age a life without pretension he may have worshipped gods like Zeus and termed old Dis a master, but then he had a strong excuse. He never heard a pastor. However, it occurs to me that had he cut Demeter and followed you or followed me, he wouldn't have been sweeter. No doubt, with shepherds of this time, he's not the clean potato because, excuse me for my rhyme, he pinned his faith to Plato. But these are facts you can't deny, my pastor, smudged and sooty. 
His mind was like a summer sky, he lived a life of beauty. To lift his brother's thoughts above this earth, he used to labour. His heart was luminous with love, he didn't wound his neighbour. To him all men were just the same, he never foamed at altars. Although he lived ere Moody came, ere Sankey dwelt in Salters. The Lycian sage, my reverend sir, had not your chances ample, but after all I must prefer his perfect pure example. You, having read the Holy Writ, the book The Angels Foster, say, have you helped us on a bit, you overfed imposter? What have you done to edify, you clammy chapel tinker? What act like his of days gone by, the grand old Asian thinker? Is there no deed of yours at all, with beauty shining through it? Ah, no, your heart reveals its gall, on every side I view it. A blatant bigot with a big, fat, heavy, fetid carcass. You will become your greasy rig, you're not a second Arcus. What sort of gospel do you preach? What Bible is your Bible? There's worse than wormwood in your speech, you livid living libel. How many lives are growing grey through your depraved behaviour? I tell you plainly, every day you crucify the Saviour. Some evil spirit curses you, your actions never vary. You cannot point your finger to one fact to the contrary. You seem to have a wicked joy in your malicious labour, endeavouring daily to destroy the neighbour's love for neighbour. The brutal curses you eject make strong men dread to hear you. The world, outside your petty sect, feels sick when it is near you. No man who shuns that little hole you call your tabernacle can have, you shriek, a ransomed soul. He wears the devil's shackle. And hence the papist, by your clan, is dogged with words inhuman, because he loves that friend of man, the highest type of woman, because he has that faith which sees, before the high creator, a virgin pleading on her knees, a shining mediator. God help the souls who grope in night, who in your ways have trusted. I've said enough, the more I write, the more I feel disgusted. The warm soft air is tainted through with your pernicious leaven. I would not live one hour with you in your peculiar heaven. Now mount your musty pulpit, thump, and muddle flat clod hoppers, and let some long-eared booby hump the plate about for coppers. At priest and parson spit and bark, and shake your church with curses, you bitter black art of the dark. With this, I close my verses. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Names Upon a Stone by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Kirby Wheeland Inscribed to G. L. Fagan, Esquire Across bleak widths of broken sea, a fierce northeaster breaks, and makes a thunder on the lee, a whiteness of the lakes. Here, while beyond the rainy stream, the wild winds sobbing blow, I see the river of my dream, four wasted years ago. Narara of the waterfalls, the darling of the hills, whose home is under mountain walls by many looted rills. Her bright green nooks and channels cool I never more may see. But ah, the past was beautiful, the sights that used to be. There was a rock pool in a glen beyond Narara's sands. The mountains shut it in from men in flowerful fairy lands. But once we found its dwelling place, the lovely and the lone, and in a dream I stooped to trace our names upon a stone. Above us, where the star-like moss shone on the wet green wall that spanned the straightened stream across, we saw the waterfall. A silver singer far away, by folded hills and hoar, its voice is in the woods to-day, a voice I hear no more. I wonder if the leaves that screen the rock-pool of the past 
are yet as soft and cool and green as when we saw them last. I wonder if that tender thing, the moss, has overgrown the letters by the limpid spring, our names upon the stone. Across the face of scenes we know there may have come a change. The places seen four years ago perhaps would now look strange. To you, indeed, they cannot be what haply once they were. A friend beloved by you and me no more will greet us there. Because I know the filial grief that shrinks beneath the touch, the noble love whose words are brief, I will not say too much. But often when the night winds strike across this sighing rills, I think of him whose life was like the rock pools in the hills. A beauty like the light of song is in my dreams that show the grand old man who lived so long as spotless as the snow. A fitting garland for the dead I cannot compass yet, but many things he did and said I never will forget. In dells where once we used to rove, the slow sad water grieves, and ever comes from glimmering grove the liturgy of leaves. But time and toil have marked my face, my heart has older grown, since in the woods I stooped to trace our names upon the stone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Like Heart by Henry Kendall Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Lordly Harp by Lordly Master Wakened from majestic sleep Yet shall speak and yet shall sing The words which make the fathers weep Voice surpassing human voices High unearthly harmony Yet shall tell the tale of hero In exalted years to be In the ranges by the rivers, on the uplands, down the dells, where the sound of wind and wave is, where the mountain anthem swells, yet shall float the song of lustre, sweet with tears and fair with flame, shining with the theme of beauty, holy with our like heart's name. Name of him who faced besides thirsty tracts of bitter glow, lurid lands that no one knows of, two and thirty years ago. Born by hills of hard grey weather, far beyond the northern seas, German mountains were his sponsors, and his mates were German trees. Grandeur of the old world forests passed into his radiant soul, with the song of stormy crescents, where the mighty waters roll. Thus he came to be a brother of the river and the wood, thus the leaf, the bird, the blossom, grew a gracious sisterhood. Nature led him to her children in a space of light divine. Kneeling down, he said, My mother, let me be as one of thine. So she took him, thence she loved him, lodged him in her home of dreams, taught him what the trees were saying, schooled him in the speech of streams. For her sake he crossed the waters, Loving her, he left the place, hallowed by his father's ashes and his human mother's face, passed the seas and entered temples domed by skies of deathless beam, walked about by hills majestic, stately spires and peaks supreme. Here he found a larger beauty, here the lovely lights were new, on the slopes of many flowers, down the gold-green dells of dew. In the great august cathedral of his holy lady, he daily worshipped at her altars, nightly bent the reverent knee, heard the hymns of night and morning, learned the psalm of solitudes, knew that God was very near him, felt his presence in the woods. But the starry angel, science, from the home of glittering wings, came one day and talked to nature by melodious mountain springs. Let thy son be mine, she pleaded, lend him for a space, she said, so that he may earn the laurels I have woven for his head. And the lady, nature, listened, and she took her loyal son from the banks of moss and myrtle, led him to the shining one. 
filled his lordly soul with gladness, told him of a spacious zone eye of man had never looked at, human foot had never known. Then the angel, science, beckoned, and he knelt and whispered low, I will follow where you lead me, two and thirty years ago. On the tracts of thirst and furnace, on the dumb, blind, burning plain, where the red earth gapes for moisture and the wan leaves hiss for rain, in a land of dry, fierce thunder, did he ever pause and dream of the cool green German valley and the singing German stream? When the sun was as a menace, glaring from a sky of brass, did he ever rest in visions on a lap of German grass? Past the waste of thorny terrors, did he reach a sphere of rills, in a region yet untravelled, ringed by fair untrodden hills? Was the spot where last he rested pleasant as an old world lee? Did the sweet winds come and lull him with the music of the sea? Let us dream so, let us hope so, haply in a cool green glade, far beyond the zone of furnace, Leichhardt's sacred shell was laid, haply in some leafy valley, underneath blue gracious skies, in the sound of mountain water the heroic traveller lies, down a dell of dewy myrtle where the light is soft and green, and a month like English April sits an immemorial queen, let us think that he is resting, think that by a radiant grave ever come the songs of forest and the voices of the wave, thus we want our sons to find him, find him under floral bowers, sleeping by the trees he loved so, covered with his darling flowers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. After Many Years by Henry Kindle, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The song that once I dreamed about, the tender, touching thing, as radiant as the rose without, the love of wind and wing, the perfect verses to the tune of woodland music set, as beautiful as afternoon, remain unwritten yet. It is too late to write them now. The ancient fire is cold. No ardent lights illume the brow, as in the days of old. I cannot dream the dream again. But when the happy birds are singing in the sunny rain, I think I hear its words. I think I hear the echo still of long-forgotten tones, when evening winds are on the hill, and sunset fires the cones. But only in the hours supreme with songs of land and sea, the lyrics of the leaf and stream, this echo comes to me. No longer doth the earth reveal her gracious green and gold. I sit where youth was once, and feel that I am growing old. The luster from the face of things is wearing all away. Like one who halts with tired wings, I rest and muse today. There is a river in the range I love to think about. Perhaps the searching feet of change have never found it out. Ah, oftentimes I used to look upon its banks, and long to steal the beauty of that brook, and put it in a song. I wonder if the slopes of moss and dreams so dear to me, the falls of flower and flower-like floss, are as they used to be. I wonder if the waterfalls, the singers far and fair, that gleamed between the wet green walls, are still the marvels there. Ah, oh, let me hope that in that place the old familiar things, to which I turn a wistful face, have never taken wings. Let me retain the fancy still that past the lordly range there always shines in folds of hill one spot secure from change. I trust that yet the tender screen that shades a certain nook remains with all its gold and green the glory of the brook. It hides a secret to the birds in waters only known, the letters of two lovely words, a poem on a stone. Perhaps the lady of the past upon these lines may light, the purest verses and the last that I may ever write. She need not fear a word of blame, 
her tale the flowers keep the wind that heard me breathe her name has been for years asleep but in the night and when the rain the troubled torrent fills i often think i see again the river in the hills and when the day is very near and birds are on the wing my spirit fancies it can hear the song i cannot sing end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of songs from the mountains by henry kindle